I hope you've made yourself a lovely cuppa and have found yourself somewhere comfy for here comes a very tall tale indeed. Mirabile dictu. A tall tale, or Mundi Authentica. L'historie est un sweet mensonge sur lequel on est d'accord. Or history is a set of lies agreed upon. Napoleon Bonaparte, after some sort of battle at Waterloo, J815. A long time ago, in a galaxy, well, maybe not so far away. The megalithic builders were prolific on every continent across the planet, hidden underfoot and in plain sight. Vast constructed sites, structures and sculptures, carved directly from bedrock or built with mortalist polygonal blocks weighing from one to thousands of tons, each irregular, multifaceted, and interlocking block meeting with laser-like precision, found drowned in the oceans or perched on mountain peaks, some so old and weathered and so gargantuan they appear as if they can only be quirky natural landscapes, genuinely awe-inspiring. And not just awe some, but awe-full. After them came builders of immensely delicate undertaking, such as pyramids, Star forts, canals, lighthouses, underground rail and then public buildings in every land, all built on specific geomantic nodes and often situated on top of the earlier megalithic foundations. Great Mother Urta has given birth to civilizations many, many, many times over from the hazy purple dawn of her Saturnian beginnings to the golden sun of blue days and black nights, with structural landscapes carved out, laid down, and built up upon her surface membranes by, well, mostly, humane beings of vastly differing stature and abilities. Our world rests on their shoulders. Round and round and round we swirl, who authors the history books? What's tucked away in Prague's Strahov Library? What's under the Vatican? What remnants still exist within the Smithsonian? Why do most people not know who their great-grandparents are? What's with the Paris catacombs? What lays below innocent-looking golf courses? Hunt that damned white rabbit, Alice. In the Archon's attempts to cement a new world narrative, using the blood and bones of the old worlds, holographic slivers of authenticity have been preserved, providing viewing portals into other times. Why have all cultures, apart from recent times, been fixated with astronomy? Ancient structures, and the older we go, the more colossal they get, encode cosmological stories of the interactions of Earth and the gods in their heavenly firmament the planets, the stars, the comets, in layout by mirroring the constellations, and in design by marking solstices, equinoxes, cometary appearances, transitions, occultations, precession of the equinoxes, as above, so below. The harmony of the spheres, macro to micro. Why was it so important for them to erect such monumental astrotheological structures sculpted from some of the densest substances on earth short of diamond, that sing like a bell when percussed? Perhaps they also had a function. 
was one function to attune, amplify and radiate the infinite, diverse and dynamic harmonies first enunciated by that which cannot be named throughout the entire planetary sphere and beyond through the infinite ether. In the beginning was the word, the thought, the name, sound, logos, created by that which cannot be named, and yet is named in the Greek Bible as the Tetragrammaton. Some may say it means four letters, but we could also think of it in terms of four measures. Think Platonic Solids. Imagine, if you will, a planet intricately laced like the flower of life, with structures and buildings designed to resonate harmoniously with the cosmos, pulsing to the beat of the earth and the heartbeats of humanity, delivering to the living world and the firmaments beyond a loving, glowing resonance, well, as well as some pretty useful analogue wireless energy. The golden age of oneness with all, Anima Mundi, a world not programmed, but tuned and co-composed by the dynamic living harmonies, rhythms and timbres of all children of Earth and their majestic built environment. Sympatico with the celestial spheres and the cosmos, majestic for the greatness of God, Magi, the wise one. Someone steeped in this culture would most definitely turn the tables of grubby moneylenders, desecrating temples of love, healing, harmony and empowerment. The ancients knew cataclysms occur at regular intervals, passing through highly energised space, cometary debris, solar flares, electromagnetic polar flips, and the Jupiterian atomistic materialism psychopathic bullies have once again fully taken advantage of these wide-scale disruptions and have completely rewritten the historical narrative of this planet. Reset! It's being rewritten this very moment. Just watch any media programming. Fascinating stuff. And fascinating is the correct word from the Latin fascinat, bewitched. From the verb fascinare, from fascinum, spell or witchcraft. Crikey, mate, even the later season of Doctor Who's a reset. There's nothing sacred anymore. Let's focus now on the last few hundred years of the most recent major reset, and more specifically the world exhibitions or fairs from the 1850s. Chicago's World Columbian Exhibition in 1893 was an astounding impossibility. It said it was to celebrate Christopher Columbus's 400th, but was it built in honour of the goddess Columba, the white dove, the Holy Ghost, an archetype of wisdom, peace, guidance and the life arts. Hang on, are we on the verge of 20th century America or are we in 2nd century BC Mediterranean? Chicago had just been through the Great Fires of 1871, a very familiar theme throughout history, where they lost 17,500 buildings many utterly gorgeous stone and brick structures. The population was around half a million at the time, yet they managed to build 690 acres of the most exquisite architectural landscape on the planet. We're told much of it was temporary, and some of it was, but most was temporarily revamped and then accidentally burned down soon after. But even if it was all temporary, how is this Herculean feat at all physically possible? Psst, you want to buy a used palace? We got plenty to choose from. How's about a cute Taj Mahal? Well, she ain't the best building on the block, but you can have her cheap. Drive away today and y'all could win yourselves a genuine stuff mammoth. No? Well, how about a used typewriter then? Guaranteed, everything you type will be epic. 1851 was the first major New World Fair in the continuing reset agendas, with London's two crystal palaces. Another impossibility. Did I say two? No, 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 no. no. Apparently there was only one, and they moved it, and, oh, and then it burnt down. Oh, dope. The New World elite were 
narcissistically showing off their trophies of conquest. Early exhibitions displayed authentic old world tech, with later world fairs exposing the new and improved corrupt corporate industry atomistic explosive destructive enslavement technologies, along with introducing the rest of the re-education process. Nowadays, exhibitions are poultry affairs indeed, but carnies are still taking us for a ride. Most cities that held New World exhibitions were the nerve centres of the real old worlds. The extensive sites and enormous structures were provided to engage the visitor in the locality's latest arts, sciences, trade, knowledge and so on. They were familiar social, intellectual and spiritual hubs for everyone and on every continent. Train stations will always be found under the largest structures. Wireless electric trams were ubiquitous, and many cities also had moving sidewalks and monorails. The main towers functioned as zeppelin stations. These were grand central stations indeed. The few buildings that remain today from these sites are nearly always libraries, museums, unis, subways. Oh, by the way... Dirigible airships, commonly known as zeppelins, are very safe until you fill them with hydrogen, coat them with staticky and flammable fabrics and glues, charge them up and then short the structure out by dropping a conducting cable. Oh, how unfortunate. Zeppelin travel is dangerous. Well, we'd better ban them. Helium, however, is very stable and non-toxic. It's said there's a scarcity of helium, but there seems to be no end of cheap party balloons. Nothing to see here, people. Keep partying. Crikey, what a beautiful, friendly and liberating way to travel. Let's now look at Australia and think of how many New World people arrived here and when and how and why did they build such impressive buildings so quickly with unskilled criminal labour using horse, cart, pickaxe and shovel. Even during depressions, droughts, fires, flood and famine, when most colonies struggled just to support themselves. Oh, I know, for morale, and just because we got nothing the better to do, we'll build impossibilities. We had quite a few world exhibitions. Melbourne, Sydney, Hobart, Adelaide, Geelong, Ballarat, Bendigo, and yes, Brisbane, always the poor cousin to the southerners, who designed and built these immense masterpieces. What was the population at the time? Where did they get the stone, bricks, metals, timber, glass, ceramics, and how did they transport and erect it all? By horse and cart? On what roads? Who made all the sculptures and artworks, and why were they all classical? Well, cameras were around from the 1840s, so why are there no construction photos or no construction plans? At best, in 19th century photos, we see cleaning, re-roofing, and renovations. Why are there almost no people in the photos, but multitudes in the paintings? Why do many buildings look partially buried? Or was putting windows at and below ground level all the rage? Why do they look aged if they are brand new? Why are the doors, the windows and the ceilings so high? Why were many of these utterly magnificent buildings demolished, costing more to bring down than supposedly put up, or destroyed by fire, only a few years after being built. Oh, of course. Stone, brick, metal, ceramic and glass will easily catch a light and burn to rubble. Buildings do that, you know. Quick emergency! Ring 911! In Brisbane, myriads of old world buildings remain extant. The City Hall, Stuart Home, St Stephen's Cathedral, the Exhibition Building Complex, including Royal Brisbane Hospital and the Martyr Hospital... Customs House, Old Parliament Building, the Windmill on the Terrace, Botanic Gardens Area, the Eternal Flame, and so on. The list is extensive, but dwindling by the day. We even had our own Astoria. Let's have a quick look at the Old Parliament Building. The photo was taken apparently a few months before the official opening of the building. And yet what do we see? We have a group of Kanakas out the front, or at least that's what we used to call them in the day. In fact, one of my ancestors was a blackbirder. If you don't know what a blackbirder is, they're people who sailed around and 
liberated savages from their terrible lives and brought them to civilization and society where they could earn themselves a living. So these chaps were brought in to look at the... Hang on, what are they doing to that building? There's ladders. Oh, it looks like they're cleaning it. I'm sorry, this building is brand new, is it not? Sadly, the two most beautiful creations, Cloudland and Her Majesty's Theatre, were demolished in the middle of the night. Oh, they were too much of a giveaway, that. And right after that sacrilege, what was dumped in Town Square? The most vile, insidious and discordant sculptures or devices called Forme del Mito, apparently about Agamemnon. Say what, huh? Do Jupiterian Archaeans think they've just defeated Saturnian Trojans again? Weird. Brisbane, 1984. Agamemnon. Hmm. I'd like to draw your attention to one thing in many of these old photos, and this is before the time of wired electricity. We have these poles, these very tall poles with multiple crossbars on them and what look like little birds sitting all the way through them. My grandparents called these swallow poles. They actually lived in China and Japan during the 1920s and 30s, and they are everywhere throughout there. The swallow in Asian cultures has quite an interesting symbology as well. In my mother's day, they were called telegraph poles. And when I was born, the telegraph lines or the phone lines were now being put underground, so they were now called electricity poles or power poles. So in three generations, we go from swallow poles to telegraph poles to power poles. Very curious. Who designed and built the world's capital buildings, the libraries, the universities, the museums, the hospitals and asylums? They're the same basic architecture across every continent and culture, across centuries, with minor cultural variances in the bling, but same, same as can still be seen today from the Vikings of St. Petersburg to the cowboys and lumberjacks of far-flung Philly. And for the really big elephant in the middle of the room? Cathedrals. The cathedral's entire structure is designed and built as one prodigious acoustic frequency energy resonator. The standard model comes fully equipped with a range of multi-ton pentatonic bells and brobbed imagined pipe organs that can easily be felt or heard over 25 miles away. Order yours today. For bespoke requests, please call our heavenly hotline on number nine, number nine, number nine. Pipe organs alone are a world of intrigue and mystery. It almost takes two people to play one, even at the most basic level. Three might suffice. And the possible combinations of timbres, modulations and octaves leaves modern digital synths in the mud. These devices are mind, body, kick-ass blowing. The world's many large organs have pipes tuned at and below the Schumann frequency, Earth's resonant frequency, and well below human hearing. But boy, can you feel it! It is orgonasmic. Honestly, the utter power and sheer wholesomeness of energy defies description. It floods every aspect of being with exhilarating euphoria. Oh, what heavenly choirs once reverberated throughout the lands. The power, the awe, the majesty. In 1939, when the music world agreed upon concert pitch being A equal 440 hertz, pipe organs were now out of tune, and their use was severely restricted. Well, good thing too. Such powerful devices in the hands of the right people could lead to spontaneous outbreaks of ecstasy and rapture. Well, that's not good for business, is it? Even all the loving vibes of the hippies was a whiter shade of pale by comparison. 
Modern rock concerts can be either an enjoyable workout or a stupefying trance, but these old devices are, in every sense, transcendent. Old world architecture was multi-purpose. Not only were cathedrals used for healing and attuning life, for every Saturn day we'd all go get a tune-up and align our internal tempos or tempers, they could also be used for harnessing, amplifying and transmitting wireless energy. Which brings us to spires and domes. The yin and yang. Cathedral domes are the mother of all. La prima donnas, the Hagia Sophias, the wombs, the yonis, the holy, holy spaces for the nurturing and development of living energies. But of course they require the right input to get them functioning. Antenna top spires are the lingams that thrust to the heavens, offering the germinative seed in order to receive blessing from the Son of God, whose name's Ray, by the way, and make it manifest when drawn down into the womb. Red mercury was the seed required to induce a flow of heavenly father energies. That's one hell of an immaculate contraption. In days gone by, all cathedrals were once called Nostradame. Our Lady, the Wise One. Sounds like somebody's name, doesn't it? Nostradame. In the simplest of terms, spires act as receivers and transmitters. Each spire, or vortex, was topped by a gold-coated sphere containing red mercury, and above that was an aerial specifically patterned to focus the frequencies required. The taller the structure, the greater the charge differential with Earth. The domes acted as amplifiers and capacitors. The building materials, whether be they marble, ceramic, copper, brass, timber, gold and so on, were conductive or dielectric, and their placement was specific and crucial, acting as transducers, resistors, insulators and so on. The entire structure acted as one stupendous acoustic, etheric, electromagnetic circuit. A cathedral or cathode from the Greek kata, meaning down, and hedral, meaning 3D geometric pattern. That is to say, a cathedral is that which draws down heavenly power, electricity, plasma, or Holy Spirit, via harmonized geometric structures. Most buildings function this way, but cathedrals and mosques took centre stage and wore the real crown. The marvels of olden technology, eh? Let's take a brief look at the interiors of these old world buildings. Who crafted these gobsmacking works of art and engineering? Photos from the Gilded Age, that is to say the robber barons who confounded America, will leave one in no doubt as to who didn't build them. Mosaic and parquetry floors beyond description. Artworks, sculptures, furniture of inimitable finesse and beauty. Every square inch of these enormous buildings intricately detailed, with gold, gold and more gold. And fireplaces. Fireplaces that were never intended for combustion. Absolute desecration. They radiated infrared frequencies. So too could pressed tin ceilings. Who would craft or paint works of art around an open fireplace? Or sculpt white delights around one? Notice that New World cities were not all built, but founded, that is to say, found and repurposed. During the last millennium, in the Americas and Australasia throughout the Pacific Rim, a series of events, tsunamis, floods, earthquakes and so on, fires, either natural or otherwise, scattered or wiped out most of those builders or descendants of the previous old world, leaving many structures intact but well weathered and partially buried. Then the New World's imperialistic corporations came along later and claimed all they could for themselves, often squabbling amongst themselves and staging wars to explain the neglect and destruction, or committing the destruction themselves. The ranks of soldiers, consisting mostly of demolition teams, structural engineers, surveyors and, oh yes, 
redesign architects. And then prisoners of the enslaved populations and orphaned children, the foundlings, were expropriated to tidy up, get the basic infrastructure going and set the stage. Then a gold rush is declared. We have an influx of new arrivals who know nothing of the local history and it's boomtown time! We have an instant city with a whitewashed past and a wholly new narrative emerges. Ballarat, Bendigo and Bathurst. Oh, they all display some beautiful old world architecture. Gold Rush Pedavore capitals. The Gold Rushes, and there were hundreds if not thousands in the New World, were a great cover for founding cities, as the Old Worlds relied heavily on gold for the planetary power grid and for healing, so it's quite common to find many Old World cities near gold deposits. The latest New World disorder appears to have been in influence throughout much of the last few hundred years, systematically destroying, perverting or corrupting all traces of Old World energy, architecture, culture and spirituality. Truly inspired Masons created a world grid of majestic masterpieces and Freemasons claimed them as maritime salvage for free. Simply change the roof lines, remove all the old world analogue wireless energy aerials, put up a death cross or flag, invent compulsory education that indoctrinates the new order, et voila, a pseudo civilization is manufactured. The matrix of lies, the swirl of time, and a muddy past ensnare even the most wary. Have all wars been designed as a cover for the conquering and destruction of the infinitely richer and more harmonious old worlds? What was so special about Dresden or Verdun that they needed total obliteration? Why, on entering Baghdad, was the museum the first place the US troops secured, only to leave it abandoned shortly after to then be looted by any and all? Most modern architecture, art, music, media, tech and so on is focused towards being ephemeral, that is to say planned obsolescence, and it's discordant. Well, except for the Schlockmeister's crowning gories, of course, what a soothing and inspiring modern masterpiece is our Forme del Mito. Don't you want to hug him? So ephemeral and discordant, dallies with built to last and harmonious, the perpetual dance of creation, swapping places of prominence in time and space, demolishing and rebuilding each other, repeating the cosmic cycles of dynamic balance in balance, balance in balance, round and round and round we swell, fractals within fractal. Let's face it. If built to last and harmonious had its way all the time, there would be nothing new under the sun. On the world stage, the 18 and 1900s was a grand double century for the delusional and narcissistic explosive expansive fairies Jupiter energies. The many big G's. Greed, gold, guns, guts and gory. Napoleon butchered the remaining heart of the great and glorious Tatarian Moor Mongol culture leaving the Jewish Bolsheviks, Stalin, Mao and Pol Pot to finish the job east of the Caucasus and World War I and World War II to finish off Europa, billions of lives sacrificed. In the Americas, the remnants of the great Amri Tartarian cultures were extinguished when they tamed the West with the Louisiana Purchase and the Great Western Expansion, Cortez and his Jesuit friends having already completed the mission to civilise much of South America. Excellent movie, by the way. Fantastic soundtrack by Ennio Morricone. The settling of the new narrative was working on a trusting, gullible or battered public. Greenwich became the new prime meridian. Technologies went from clean and wholesome to toxic and expensive non-renewables. They went from wireless energy to dirty electricity and cool, life-giving implosion plasma tech to degenerative heat explosion tech. Schools became compulsory along with the freshly written narratives in 
geopolitics, history, the arts and sciences. Universities became specialised and abstract, with each strand disappearing up its own mythical black hole. Banking corporations thrived, cementing themselves into modern life, along with compound interest and fractional reserve lending, and most importantly, commandeering the ability to control the supply of money, the reserve banking system. Most royal bloodlines were by now illegitimate, blackmailed and interbred with the corporation families. Natural medicine was outlawed by allopathic slash burn poison medicine, alchemy was dumbed into chemistry and natural philosophy was reduced to atomistic materialism with people like Pasteur who invented germ theory by corrupting Beauchamp's ideas. Edison, G.E. Westinghouse by introducing gross inefficiency and disharmony into electromagnetic development, for who's ever heard of Charles Proteus Steinmetz or Eric P. Dollard or Ken Wheeler? And then Darwin, whose twisted theories were twisted even further into survival of the fittest, leaving us into mazes of discordant blind alleys. And now in 2021, it seems they have almost complete control with a world dependent upon, no, addicted to, invasive and discordant digital tech, media programming and the consumption of toxic substances in our food, water and air. Whether AIs are possible or not, there are, at this very moment, highly sophisticated algorithms running on D-wave computers that simulate every person on Earth. One of them is learning you. It seems there is nowhere left we can escape the influence of the digital algorithms, nowhere to be alone with natural resonances. While we are in lockdown, the world is being strung with a matrix of big G towers. Our planet is being flooded with abrasive and destructive frequencies, and every aspect of our being is being assaulted with toxic discordances. The Archons have massive underground cities they believe will protect them from the coming waves of change, and seed banks if everything is obliterated. Will Kill Bill open the gates of hell and save the world with a mandatory jab of the beast? Beware all mask wearers. Dark forces plan to pervert Mother Earth's analogue harmonious, flower-of-life energy grid into a digital programmed hive of indentured servitude drones. It's always darkest before the dawn, as the old saying goes. The heavens do not concur with earthly rulers' agendas. What lies concealed in the Antarctic, and why are we not permitted to travel beyond 60 degrees south latitude? Why have so many world leaders visited there recently? Where did the ideas for Wakanda, Xanadu, Agartha and Shambhala originate? And what can we learn from them? It's really no wonder that schooling, especially history, was such a drag. It was pulp fiction, with a depressing and nihilistic narrative as if the tapestries of history were shredded into millions of fragments, expurgated, muddied, randomised and then set in concrete, with the ensuing mess presented as reality. Add a thousand years here, confuse one culture for another, confuse one country for another, change the language we speak, change the timekeeping system, the measurement system and the mapping coordinates, invent divisive religions based on a pine cone of truth, Monetize everything. Program us through media that we are violent, savage and warlike creatures and that we are, at one and the same time, both damned in sin by the act of being born and are the pinnacle of a transitory, meaningless, mechanistic, evolutionary process. Deranged fantasy, all of it. Why were we forced to read Lord of the Flies, if not for traumatic competition programming? Imagine if the story continued on where it started with cooperation. That would have been a good fun read instead of countless horrific nightmares. 
but these were the lessons we had to have to toughen us for the real world. Sick. It could have been a lesson on identifying psychopathic tendencies in ourselves and others, and how to disempower that zealotry, but no. It says our basic instincts are predominantly brutal and demonic, and in the natural order, you have to be a psycho bully yourself just to live. Ralph is saved only by accepting maritime civility, that is to say, admiralty law. To its credit, it does show us the dangers of herd mentality. What is it to be human? To be a member of the human race? To be humane is to be human, and there is only one human race, the humane race. Would it not be wise, then, to be an intolerant racist? That is to say, to never tolerate those who choose to be inhumane, irrespective of their appearance, and to also welcome any humane being, whatever their appearance, or whatever their taxonomy, for that matter. Speaking of which, there are only two genders, male and female. This is not political or social speak, but biological taxonomy. Any other biological variation that cannot duplicate or reproduce would be classified as neuter. Male and female together generate life. Gene. Genesis. Gender as a social or cultural reference, or preference, is a recent phenomenon indicative of how discombobulated the world has become. The older worlds were far greater and richer than we can imagine. We are puny beings indeed compared with our forebears. But we must needs start imagining because we now witness not just the end of a civilization, but the end of an era and the birth of a new. The heavens have inspired us and guided our way through many precessions of the equinoxes and the heavens now decree that we are cusping the age of Aquarius. It's one second to midnight, and the fascinating and delusional power worlds of Jupiter Pisces are being surpassed by Saturn Aquarius. Shift happens. The new New World Order will find many bogged in rigid belief systems they cannot rise above, especially those fixated in delusional programming, modern material sciences, or indeed any dogmatic structure. All those living in fear and limitation will suffer greatly and will violently vent their fears on others. Dangerous times and revelatory times are with us. A new golden age begins with us. The time has come to face the demons, within and without, to openly face them with love and compassion. Revelations and apocalypse both mean the same thing, a lifting of the veils when everything will be revealed, the good, the bad and the ugly. Facing the darkness within and without will horrify, it will disgust, anger, revolt, depress and terrify all good souls, but these must be passed through for healing to begin. I might just mention here that if anyone has been abused throughout their life, then please do a web search for the video of Annika Lucas's journey. She is an archangel, an electric messenger. Demons will always be within and without us, but if we are aware of them and can face them, firmly earthed, united in love and harmony, honesty and integrity, we can, as a start, soothe those savage beasts and light a way for those still lost in dark matter. What is it to be healthy in mind, body, spirit? Let's flip the question. What most disrupts health in mind thought in body toxins in spirit trauma we can do a great deal of world healing simply by removing disruptive programming from our thoughts removing toxins from our environment and removing trauma from our lives 
and especially from the lives of children, for they are our legacy and our future. It is as it was and shall ever be. No matter how things change, it comes down to us, hic et nunc, here and now, with the choices embedded in the dynamics of physical existence, submerged in love and fear, chaos and harmony, cooperation and competition. But black is no colour, and white every colour is, and the pendulum keeps swinging. And this time the scythe of Saturn reaps the heads of hydras whereby a new golden age can emerge. While swirling through the ether on the carnal carnival wheel of life, archetypal themes keep dancing familiar steps with unique variations in the patterns. Harmony, rhythm, timbre and tempo, frequency, modulation, amplitude and period, resistance, capacitance, permeability and permittivity, motion, force, inertia and acceleration throughout the entire magnetic electrospectrum, of which our five basic senses are aware of but a mere fraction. The archetypal vectors of energy run spatial and counterspatial, circular and radial, that is to say hyperboloid toroidal or hourglass donut shape. Harmonic within harmonic of physical existence, form and function. Patterns form in respect to frequencies, as cymatic so clearly demonstrates. Solid appearing objects resonate at frequencies specific to their existence in space-time, that is their physical characteristics, the size, shape, thermal gradient, density, conductivity and so on, and in relation to their local and cosmic environment. And just as important is the converse. Solid appearing structures in form respective frequencies. To massage the Bauhaus motto form follows function into form follows frequency in the case of cymatics, it remains equally true that frequency follows form. In the simplest of terms, form and frequency are like an organ pipe compared to the space within. One's visible, the other audible. The form defines the space, and the confined space defines the frequency. Therefore, when form varies, so too does frequency, realised only by those with eyes to see and ears to hear. Why is the old world built to golden ratios? Why do we see aspects of the flower of life repeated throughout? Patterns within patterns. The flower of life, the seed of life, the fruit of life, the rhythm of life, the song of life, the tapestry of life, anima mundi, with each individual contributing, be they aware or no. What tones, melodies and rhythms are we adding to this universal symphony? Are we not authors of our own songline? Do we not all desire an authentic life? Let us not be swayed by the discordant cacophony of his story. What is our own story, and how does that change the composition? Perhaps it's time to attune with our true ancestors and join in the genuine songline that we may better discern the patterns allowing us greater creativity to explore song lines throughout all realms. What rippling echoes will our co-composed songs throughout eternity leave? We are, one and all, a spiritual being experiencing physical existence. Even crippled and deformed modern science tells us that each and every subatomic particle oscillates in and out of existence trillions of times a second. Like countless tiny bubbles rising up and passing away, rising up and passing away, as Buddha is quoted as saying. So the entire universe only exists in the physical realm half the time at best. Ain't it grand? 
Lo, through the slivers, there do I see my father. Lo, there do I see my mother and my sisters and my brothers. Lo, there do I see the line of my people back to the beginning. Lo, they do call to me. They bid me take my place amongst the choir, in the halls of the hallowed, where the songs may live forever. Well, might be a nice place to visit for a while. Or just hang out here and shine a little longer. Or maybe it's time to get off the carnal carnival ride completely. Choices, choices, choices. So, did I mention, whoever told you we ascended from apes was quite mistaken. <laughs> yes, you got it. We descended from giants. I trust this tall tale was a challenging, stimulating and rewarding read. Make of it what you will, research it, develop it, condense it or consign it all to fantasy, of which some of it surely is, though always remember, believe nothing, no matter where you read it, no matter if I have said it, unless it agrees with your own reason and your own common sense. Attributed to Siddhartha Gautama Buddha. So, loving vibes to one and all. Amore, more, ore, re. With love, behaviour, words and actions. Thank you, Virgil. The moving finger writes, and having writ, moves on. Nor all thy piety nor wit shall do your writ back to cancel half a line. Nor all thy tears Wash out a word of it. Omar Simps Anton. Omar Khayyam. And for the final mercurial cherry on top, check out a sculpture called Il Disignano by Francesco Quirola. Late Baroque, apparently, I-754, somewhere around there. In English, it's called Release from Deception. Wonder why. Even a casual glance of this impossible masterpiece is enough to instantly discard a plethora of held beliefs and flip the well switch on in any slightly aware being. Bernini and Corradini are other baroque sculptors. Enjoy! And if anything presented here stimulated something within you, may this be a portal for many more epiphanies, and may the spirit of inquiry be with us always. Who knows, we may just wipe some effluent from the windshield of awareness. Go boldly forward and trust yourself. Your way becomes apparent when you walk it. Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. George Orwell, 1984-1947 So... Carpe diem, seize the present moment. Thank you.